Any good? There we go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, thank you to the uh, conference organizers for giving me the chance to present here. This is a very exciting online conference and I've had a lot of uh, interesting talks already. And uh, I'm going to be talking about some of our uh, interesting science here at Wayne State University on uh, highly polarized and long-lived uh, isom isotopologs of metronidazole and uh, how we're going to use spin relays and sabre sheath to maximize our usefulness of uh, sabre sheath in this way. So uh, I'm going to do a quick uh, overview of uh, 15 nitrogen NMR and how we uh, employ that with sabre sheath in terms of spectroscopy. I'm going to talk a little bit about our present and previous studies investigating how we increase polarization, extend relaxation times, and how we translate those applications to a wide variety of biomolecules. I'll talk about our 87% uh, liquid nitrogen parahydrogen generator that is used for this process. And I'll discuss some of the metronidazole 15N3 labeled studies that we're going to be uh, presenting and talking about relaxation and uh, polarization effects. So Thomas gave a very good introduction to uh, Sabre Sheath this morning, and I'll just briefly uh, kind of go over that once again. So we're using uh, cost-effective microtesla magnetic fields that are uh, fairly accessible to anyone who wants to get into the field. Um, we're facilitating polarization exchange from parahydrogen to the heteronuclei, which is going to be 15 nitrogen for us, but we can do it for a wide variety of other biomolecules if we wish to do so via a catalyst. And just with traditional Sabre, we'll be uh, binding reversibly the parahydrogen and the target. And then the singlet parahydrogen spin order is going to be transferred between them across first two chemical bonds via the uh, catalyst center. But we'll also see how we can transfer it to greater distances later on. And uh, we're employing fields well below Earth's field. So it's 0.4 microtesla in our studies. And we do that via a, a mu metal shield that we run a current through that gives us a small local field and it just negates the uh, external Earth's field. So the initial studies by uh, Thomas's group achieved 10% 15 nitrogen polarization in uh, pyridine, uh, 15 nitrogen spectroscopy. And uh, this was developed further by uh, Trong and co-workers to dis uh, develop the possibility of high-polarized imaging of nitrogen-15 also in pyridine. And uh, this study investigated a lot of how we optimize um, the high-polarization process, including how effective you can uh, decide on what flow rate should be, the temperature, the ratio of the substrate to the catalyst, and so on. And that's going to be a real important pursuit going forward that we're going to discuss. And to give a little example of those optimizations, on the right-hand side, you can see some very recent results from our group of individually labeled 15 nitrogen sites in uh, metronidazole, which has three nitrogen sites. So we're looking at one site in particular of the compound hyperpolarized achieved using magnetic field cycling. And that's at one millimeter squared uh, spatial resolution. So nitrogen is interesting because it is almost everywhere, at least in its common 14 nitrogen form. And it's a common component of many important amino acids, uh, proteins, pharmacological drugs, and so on. So um, if we can label those compounds with nitrogen 15, then obviously we can see them. And nitrogen 15 is a very interesting isotope because it has a huge chemical shift dispersion range, which makes it very sensitive to its local environment. So if we could effectively and cheaply label a variety of compounds, we could use those to assess the efficacy of uh, types of drugs, uh, their uptake, metabolic processes, and so on. Unfortunately, a lot of molecular structures, including uh, hydride um, and uh, 14 nitrogen in particular, are quadrupolar in nature. So they act as very efficient sinks for the hyperpolarization, which, it max which reduces our maximum achievable uh, signal and it hastens the relaxation and we don't want to be mass producing labeled compounds without knowing that they're going to be conducive to polarization transfer because that's obviously quite expensive and it could be wasteful uh, but uh, Roman Shepin and co-workers demonstrated that visible hyperpolarization of uh, 15 nitrogen labeled pyridine uh, was um, even scalable back down to natural abundance which is 0.4 percent uh, of nitrogen, nitrogen atoms are nitrogen 15. So if we can observe 
how effective something's going to be, even at natural abundance, then that saves a lot of time uh, and uh, money not having to hyperpolarize things that may not be useful. So Sabre sheath has been applied to a lot of different heteronuclear structures, but we're going to focus, as I said, on nitrogen 15, and in particular, uh, 15N labeled metronidazole, which is an FDA approved antibiotic primarily used for treating bacterial infections in anaerobic environments. And uh, you can see by the pathway at the top here that in low oxygen environments, metronidazole is in like a reversible state with this uh, nitroso intermediate form. But as you remove more and more oxygen, you have an irreversible uh, reduction reaction here that results in an amino derivative. And the, each of the numbers that you can see here is a chemical shift in uh, PPM. And you can see that each different stage of the process results in a vast change in the chemical shift, which tells us a lot about the local environment. And when we get to the amino derivative at the end of this chain, that structure can no longer leave the cell that it has been taken up in. So it can tell us a lot about where an anaerobic in particular environment is. And a lot of other nitro imidazole moieties such as fluoromycin imidazole or f -miso, have been used extensively in PET or positron emission tomography to detect these anaerobic cell structures such as uh, hypoxia. But uh, the distinct chemical shift change in nitrogen 15 is what's really interesting to us and what makes it more pronounced than other uh, nitrometazole derivatives. So a lot of previous studies reported on the nitrogen 15 polarization transfer that is directly coupled to the catalyst, so the uh, N1 site. And uh, uh, like Barsky and co-workers demonstrated uh, nitrogen 15 levels of 24% in natural abundance uh, 15N metronidazole on the catalyst bound site after one minute of uh, parahydrogen bubbling, and you can see that on the right side here, and some very recent uh, optimizations to that process by Simon Duckett and co-workers with regards to uh, even how quickly you shake the sample, so you can see the uh, results here, can have a, an effect on what your polarization achievable is, have allowed them to get to 50% uh, polarization, which is uh, really impressive. And uh, going back to um, Danila's uh, study, it really demonstrated that even though it was most efficient to hyperpolarize the site that was bound to the catalyst, you could still detect observable polarization via these weak but non-negligible J-couplings to the distant sites. And it was really uh, the presence of quadrupolar sites uh, such as CH3 or 14N that was hindering that polarization buildup. And that study has really led our drive to try and uh, hyperpolarize the other heteronuclear sites more efficiently. So there's the two aspects of hyperpolarization and relaxation that are, we're considering. And one is obviously the catalyst itself is very good at transferring hyperpolarization to our sample. But when we stop bubbling, it's also very good at sucking that hyperpolarization, that signal back up. And the polarization transfer catalyst that is commonly used, which is an iridium center in our studies, um, at low field in particular, is very good at uh, draining that, uh, that polarization away. So we want to try and minimize the catalyst relaxation and extend the lifetime of our hyperpolarization. And uh, Rice Kidd and co-workers demonstrated a, an effective technique for removing their catalyst using silicon nanoparticles, which achieved polarizations of 34%. So we're already going kind of 50% higher than what's been seen in previous studies. And when transferring their sample of hyperpolarized metronidazole to a 0.3 Tesla storage field, they extended their hyperpolarization lifetime to over three minutes, which is easily a usable lifetime for um, injection and imaging purposes. But the other aspect is what do, effect does the quadrupolar 14N nucleus have on relaxation? And uh, Roman Shepin and co workers studied that um, in doubly labeled carbon 13 and nitrogen 15 metronidazole. And they noticed that at micro Tesla fields, all of the spins, so proton, C13, and N15, all shared a similar relaxation time because their Zeeman levels were highly mixed. And that was kind of consistent with what was, what was expected. And it was shown that most of the relaxation processes uh, were due to the catalyst and uh, obviously the nitrogen 14 quadrupolar center via these short spin-spin couplings. And you could sort of selectively hyperpolarize individual sites, so the N3 or the N1 site, by magnetic field cycling. 
but ultimately your T1 was far too short, only on the order of about four seconds in this micro Tesla regime to kind of be useful. And I'm gonna demonstrate that with a slightly tangential case study in carbon 13, which is uh, another piece of work by Denny Lebarski and coworkers, which uh, looked at carbon 13 labeled, uh, sorry, so naturally abundant um, pyridine looking at carbon 13, where one example was a natural abundance 14N pyridine in the ring, and then the other one was a 15N labeled uh, isotopolog and they compared the two and carbon 13 polarization was about one or 2% in the nitrogen 15 labeled isotopolog, but there was almost no uh, visible NMR on C13 from the natural abundance pyridine because N14 is acting as such an effective quadrupolar sink in this regime. So that brings us to where we are now, where we're looking to complete this kind of holy trinity of maximizing our achievable polarization minimizing relaxation either due to the catalyst or quadrupolar centers and also uh, increasing the versatility by using spin spin relay mechanisms to apply saber sheath to as wide a variety of molecules as possible and in our studies on uh, nitrogen 15 metronidazole saber sheath we employed a custom built parahydrogen generator which is automated and uh, all of your valves can be controlled automatically it operates in a high pressure regime of uh, 500 PSI inlet uh, hydrogen and 94 PSI or about six and a half bar para hydrogen outlet pressure into our NMR tube. And this allows for high throughput at a clinical scale. We have a vacuum pumped liquid nitrogen uh, cryo cooler and we use this to obtain a para hydrogen enrichment fraction of about 87% at uh, temperatures of 45 Kelvin. So we're trying to balance the line between cost-effective liquid nitrogen, uh, but also getting some of the results from uh, lower temperatures in like a liquid helium design. And this is on the order of about one hour to achieve 87% power hydrogen enrichment. And this facilitated a lot of different studies into both hyperpolarization buildup and relaxation in the different isotopologues of metronidazole at fairly low cost that we're gonna look at some of here. So I mentioned that quadrupolar nitrogen 14N is a problem because it acts as a efficient sink. And in that case, why not just get rid of the 14N? Let's label all of the nitrogen sites with nitrogen 15. So uh, we produced a triply labeled uh, 15 nitrogen metronidazole via a fairly inexpensive synthesis method. And uh, this gave us a yield of about 15%. And then Nikita Chukhanov is going to be giving a talk on Wednesday and a poster as well that tells a lot more about the synthesis process of this and other uh, nitro derivatives. So if you're interested in that in particular, then I recommend going to see that. And we had 20 millimolar of this uh, 15 N3 labeled metronidazole and a one millimolar of our catalyst in 0.6 milliliters of deuterated methanol. And this kind of nitrogen 15 enrichment process costs about $67 per gram. So really not that expensive in the context of like labeling these compounds for potential uh, spectroscopy use. A saber sheath was performed, as I said, at 0.4 microtesla magnetic fields inside a new metal shield with 94 PSI of hydrogen. And we are bubbling at about 60 to 150 uh, SCCM flow rate, depending on what kind of application we're seeking to do. This was just done in a simple NMR uh, tube that was transferred into a 1.4 Tesla bench top spectrometer. And obviously we build up inside the shield with uh, the hydrogen being bubbled through. We stop the bubbling, we transfer into the uh, 1.4 T spectroscopy uh, device, and then we just observe the um, signal that we receive. So we use thermal uh, nitrogen 14 pyridine as a reference, and we uh, noticed a 300,000 fold signal enhancement across all three of our nitrogen 15 sites. So N3, N1, and the nitro group 15 NO2. And you can see the uh, pyridine spectrum at the top here has been increased a factor of 128 fold uh, to, to zoom in to you can see the difference in the signal there. And what's really interesting here is we see this similar uh, enhancement factor across all three of the sites, even though the 15 NO2 site is six chemical bonds away from the uh, bound hydride on the uh, polarization transfer catalyst. Uh, we're determining that that pathway is exclusively through the heteronuclear nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 15, and it doesn't pass through any of the single bond um, 
like the C4 site or any of the, uh, the other carbon sites that are, that are bound there. So we see a respectable polarization of about 16% when we account for that enhancement factor across all three of the sites. And this was achieved after about 30 seconds of parahydrogen bubbling. The polarization and the buildup rates were highest at the directly catalyst bound site, 15N3, and the NO2 site, which is the most distant, took the longest to build up. When we look at uh, the dependence of the magnetic field on the polarization we achieve, we found that 0.4 Tesla was our uh, best and most effective field, and that effectively gave us the best build up at all three of our sites. And until we went to very, very low fields, there was very little difference in the polarization dynamics as a function of field. And we, again, think that's a local source of polarization spin transfer from N3 to N1 to N02 site, rather than the very weak uh, coupling between the catalyst and the distant NO2 site. And uh, lastly, we observed long relaxation time constants of about 20 to 30 seconds at 0.4 microtesla on all three sites. And when we transferred to a strong magnetic field inside the spectrometer of 1.4 T, where the scalar spin-spin coupling was larger, we determined that the 15 NO2 site relaxed a lot slower, a three-fold slower, uh, and it was almost on the order of 10 minutes compared to those sites that were more closely bound to the polarization transfer catalyst. By transferring the sample to the Earth's field and watching as the spins evolve at, low, at even, very, even lower, so 0.1 microtesla fields uh, up to Earth's field, we observed that there's a decrease in the uh, N3, the locally bound site, and then the NO2 and the N1, the more distant sites, actually increase in their polarization even after you've stopped bubbling indicating that the polarization is being kind of shared between these sites in like an interlinked nature. And they all kind of gradually pool their, um, their, their polarization as a, as a group, rather than kind of one hogging all the polarization and then the others all relaxing at different rates. And as this solvent was evaporated via bubbling, um, via parahydrogen, and we effectively increased our substrate concentration, we didn't really notice any difference in the level of polarization that we could achieve. So I think that indicates that we can repolarize our samples many times without a decrease in efficiency, uh, which is uh, obviously excellent for uh, applications to Sabre because it is reversible. The whole idea is that we can polarize it again and again and get some of the results, and that's demonstrated here. We uh, also determined the scalar coupling constants of all of the nitrogen and 1H um, bonds at 9.4 Tesla. And we did this by just acquiring a lot of nitrogen 15 NMR peaks with and without proton decoupling. And we determined the chemical shift dispersion between each of these peaks in order to determine the, uh, the, J, the J coupling between each one. And you can see that the J coupling between the nitrogen sites, the N3 and the N1, and then the N1 and the NO2 is some of the lowest and most efficient J coupling of all of the different um, couplings in this uh, metronidazole molecule, which I think is also giving more evidence towards that pathway across the six chemical bonds from the bound hydride all the way to the NO2 that we've discussed before. And uh, I think that's a fairly kind of invaluable proof that uh, the six chemical bond argument is uh, helping us to pool our polarization rather than having one J coupling from the hydride to the N3 and then another less effective but still working uh, bond directly to the N1 and then to the N2 as well. So you'll notice that I previously mentioned that there was kind of the three aspects of the holy grail we were talking about, the polarization, the relaxation, and obviously the versatility. And I haven't really talked about relaxation that much. And that's because uh, one of my colleagues, Ashfi, is going to be giving a talk on Wednesday looking at uh, this relaxation uh, between 15N3 and 15N2 isotopologues of metronidazole in a lot more detail. And um, I can kindly encourage you to head to that on, on the Wednesday if you want to see kind of this aspect of the conclusion of the story. But going forward from looking at um, N3 metronidazole, we obviously want to look at um, transfer of polarization between 15 nitrogen and uh, protons, of course, in the microtesla regime, because we only really looked at that uh, binding that transfer between different nitrogen sites. 
And uh, of course, we want to also look at other um, labeled and naturally abundant nitrominazole compounds because there's no guarantee that metronidazole is the most effective at this, at this stage. It's, it's one of the most studied, but it might not be the best. And new compounds and new labeling techniques are being developed all the time. We are currently awaiting the installation and it's been a bit delayed by uh, coronavirus, unfortunately, but someday, maybe soon, maybe not so soon. We're expecting the installation of a 0.35 Tesla uh, MRI scanner, and that will facilitate a lot of more uh, in vivo studies. And before we get to that, we really want to do some kind of precursor studies to uh, removal of the catalyst and how we're going to transfer our medium from an alcoholic one, which is the deuterated methanol, into an injectable water medium. That's obviously going to be a lot more in vivo and see how that affects our polarization losses as well. And we're also going to try and simulate in vivo effects inside uh, human and obviously animal studies by using uh, enzymatic processes to break down the uh, nitrobidazole compounds, as I mentioned earlier, into those kind of intermediate phases, the hypoxic stages, and try and work out, simulate how our um, compounds will fare and what we expect to see when we actually move on to in vivo relaxation studies. So uh, to conclude, I'd like you all to take home that Sabre Sheath has a lot of potential to hyperpolarize a wide variety of biomedically relevant molecules at low cost with observable uh, polarization on 50 nitrogen, even at natural abundance. And I hope that's going to pave the way for the evaluation of drug efficacy without producing large quantities of potentially unuseful labeled compounds. Um, also, we're seeking an environment where hyperpolarization buildup and the lifetime are maximized by limiting the quadrupolar relaxation, both due to the catalyst and uh, any kind of 14N sites or similar. And um, how the 15 nitrogen group in uh, 15N3 labeled metronidazole in particular achieves this by acting as a slow draining reservoir of polarization, which extends the polarization lifetime and the T1. And also that this work can be applied to other biomolecules, potentially increasing the versatility of the saber sheath technique and also um, increasing the variety of potentially useful contrast agents that are accessible to biomedicine. So uh, I'd just like to thank my colleagues and collaborators and obviously our funding sources. Again, thank the conference organizers for giving me the chance to uh, participate here. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed uh, both this talk and obviously the first day of talks. I'm looking forward to uh, the remaining two days. So thank you very much. Thank you for a great talk, Jonathan. Um, Metronasal is just an amazing molecule. It has some really cool properties, uh, especially with Sabre. Uh, we have a number of questions that have been queued up. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I guess some technical questions about the instrumentation. Um, what temperature is achieved with the liquid nitrogen vacuum pumped cryostat and how much liquid nitrogen does it use per unit time? So I'll scroll back to here. Yeah. So uh, we're operating at uh, about 45 to 50 Kelvin after we uh, perform the vacuum pumping. I'm not 100% sure what the kind of liquid nitrogen usage is. I need to head back into our lab and dig through some old notes. Some of this work was done at the end of 2018, so uh, I can't answer that right now, but uh, to whoever's interested in that, I'll try and get that information and um, answer that one in the, the Slack breakout room um, as soon as I get that information. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Um, and then some more chemical questions about the metronidazole binding in the Sabre system. Um, how do you know for sure that the NO2 group is not binding directly to the iridium catalyst? And then a second follow-up to that is, is there a labile, labile OH group in the metronidazole? And have you ever tried hyperpolarizing using a relayed or saber relay type method? So I'm going to kind of say, I'm not, I don't think we know for sure that we're not directly binding to the 15 nit the nitro group, but I am going to say that I feel it's heavily inferred given that there is such a similar polarization and the signal enhancement factor observed across all three sites. Knowing that the 15 NO2 site is so distant from the catalyst and we know that the direct J coupling from previous studies is so weak, we wouldn't expect to see such a strong signal if it was directly bound between the PTC and the 15 NO2 and there was no 
crosstalk between the different nitrogen sites going on. So there may be some aspect of direct binding, but I think the majority of the signal is coming from the, the spin relaying effect. And there was a second part to that question as well. Could you yeah, about that? using a Sabre relay to try and hyperpolarize through the, um, the OH group. So uh, as I said, one of the things we want to move on to is looking at uh, polarization transfer between 1H and 15 nitrogen. Uh, currently, we haven't done anything looking at binding, uh, like kind of binding differences in exchange between the 1H and the 15N. But for sure, that would be something that would be uh, very uh, interesting and insightful to, to investigate. And then one more question was about uh, solvent evaporation. How robust is the polarization to solvent evaporation? So if I scroll back to here. So we were bubbling across a, the course of, I think, about two hours in this experiment. And we started with about, uh, our, our sample was made up in 0.6 milliliters of uh, solvent. And we initially created a 20 millimolar catalyst. We measured via fairly crude approximation of the height of our solvent, how much solvent was left and therefore estimating what the concentration was. And uh, we really didn't see any drop in polarization that you could achieve in the, either of the sites until you really got down to kind of 70, 80, 100 uh, millimolar where you've got almost no solvent left uh, at all. Like you're, like, like you're, you're less than half of your original kind of solvent is, is remaining. So uh, for sure, you could study that in a larger sample to get a more um, like minute, like a, a smaller um, investigation of how small changes affect that. But we really didn't notice any significant difference across the range we studied. Great. Well, thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, and I'm sure if anyone else has any questions in the future, they'll, they'll shoot you a message on Slack. Okay. Thank you, everyone.